Hi, and welcome to The Climate Show. My name is Theo Talcott. I'm joined by Camilla Reese and Tina Victor. And we're here to discuss uh, smart meters, uh, electromagnetic pollution, and uh, some of the issues around cell phones and the health hazards uh, therein. Um, Camilla is a famous author, and uh, Tina is going to give a brief bio. Uh, Camilla Reese, MBA, is a leading activist in the U.S. on the subject of electromagnetic fields and health, collaborating with scientists and other advocacy groups globally. She founded www.electromagnetichealth.org. Welcome, Camilla. Thank you. It's great to be here. Okay. Um, so why don't we jump in on the smart meters? Uh, so CVPS and uh, Vermont Power Companies are trying to in introduce a new meter that um, <coughs> basically runs on the cell phone technology, which uh, Wi-Fi, and. Uh, we think it's dangerous, and I'm part of a group that's trying to stop it. Uh, maybe you can jump in on the smart meters? Mm -hmm. Well, all around the country, people are upset that they're rolling out these um, radio mesh networks um, that are going to bring ra a, level, a new level of radiation into people's lives through the meter that's attached to the home. Um, eventually, um, appliances like dishwashers, washing machines, etc., are going to be communicating in your home to that meter. And so um, people in California are getting sick. There are 40 towns that have put a moratorium on these meters. They are up in arms protesting in the street, um, physically getting electricians to take the meter off their house and return them to the, um, to the utility. Why? Because this type of radiation is making people sick. Um, the, um, there are many studies showing what are called electrosensitivity symptoms that um, that show in increased incidence of um, fatigue, focus problems, um, irritability, um, insomnia, terrible sleep problems related to this radiation. It's the same radiation that's coming out of a Wi-Fi router or a cell phone or a portable phone or a, or a baby monitor even. They're just putting um, putting this into our house and we're not going to be able to avoid it. We can't turn it off. It's going to be there all the time unless we take a stand and say we want a wired meter and not a wireless meter in our community. Right on. So you're describing sort of this modern plague which is that everywhere the design of all these modern tools is uh, wirelessness and um, and it seems like our world is gradually filling up with more and more of this electrosmog and um, so well, I think that um, people th assume that because the cell phone industry is pervasive now, it's a trillion dollar industry, uh, five billion people around the world are using cell phones, um, they assume that somebody must have checked this technology out and that it must be safe. But the reality is that there was no pre-market health testing required in the United States on any of these technologies. And well, we could say, well, maybe they just didn't know at the time that this industry you know, started to emerge. But the reality is that the research goes back to the 1920s and 30s, where um, research from our, our government, military research from countries around the world have shown biological effects from this radiation. Um, that, um, the radiation is biologically active. It degrades the processing systems in our body over time. And sometimes people are exquisitely sensitive and have an acute reaction. And those are the people complaining about the smart meters because they're getting headaches and they know that they're not functioning right or having focus problems. But other people, the biology has also been shown as being affected whether or not people have the symptoms. There's inflammation we know is happening in the skin of the people that don't even have the symptoms. So it's... Um, it's important to realize that this is disrupting our physiological functioning. And if you persist and expose yourself to this continually over the long term, they're the long term and cumulative effects that are really unknown. Um, and and the, the most serious aspect of it is that um, the, the science that shows DNA effects. And we've known for 25 years that there are single and double strand DNA breaks from this type of radiation. And there have been a slew of studies over the past decades showing the DNA, DNA effects of this kind of radiation. And this, this thing I find fascinating about the, that the DNA acts as a fractal antenna, the coil of coils, and it just sort of catches it. And because the DNA runs on subtle electrical charges on, it, by its design, it's very receptive. And so you get these DNA breaks, and um, 
I, yeah, you're referring actually to the um, the research by Dr. Martin Blank at Columbia University that was published last year, where DNA was shown that because of its coil of coil structure, it is exquisitely sensitive, more sensitive than any other tissue in the body to these kind of fields and to all kinds of um, frequencies, not just the ones in the um, cell phone and Wi-Fi and smart meter range, but the lower frequencies too, like from right. electricity. In indigenous cultures, they've often used sound as healing. They'll, shamans will sing into the body as a way to heal DNA breaks and to heal sickness. And here we have, uh, you know, sort of the modern society doing kind of the opposite direction of just bombarding the body with sort of random waves. Yeah, there's an extreme lack of consciousness here. Um, who knows why or how it began, but it's gotten out of hand. We're beyond the point where um, it's, we're beyond the threshold and um, where things are, people are getting sick. Their children are being, so many children being born with developmental problems. Um, it's been shown that in the mothers, uh, in a small pilot study done by Dietrich Klinghardt, and, uh, Dr. Dietrich Klinghardt in Seattle, that um, the mothers who had the children who were autistic, their bedroom radio frequency level was 20, 20 to 21 times higher than the mothers that had the healthy children. So there's a real question, especially given the trajectory, the growth in autism in our culture. We're now, uh, I think it was in 2002, it was one in, one in 150 children, and now it's down to one in one in 70 or 90, depending on whether it's a boy or a girl. So these, uh, where's it going from here? That is a fascinating study. The, uh, think of this as packets of energy, and it's pushing our body, it's creating stress in our body. And it, it's um, well documented that this kind of radiation creates excess stress proteins. And so the body thinks of this attack, this pressure, this uh, energy that it's being um, exposed to as 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 a stressor and it's responding in a way as if it were any other kind of stress and so there's a wide large body of research linking stress to all, all, every kind Everything. of illness known mm -hmm. yeah stress mm -hmm. cortisol and adrenaline and all mm -hmm. that um do you want to talk a little bit to the privacy issue as well um especially what you were saying about uh what the developments in in nevada yeah, um, you know, a lot of people have raised the question of why are they rolling out these smart meter systems throughout this country and actually throughout the world um, so rapidly? Why is this being pushed down people's throats without c proper consideration and also without the functionality in the meters themselves that would allow for the integration of the renewable energy technologies so that it would lead us towards sustainability, which is the whole point of having a smart grid. We need to get off of fossil fuels and we need to um, um, become self-sufficient energy-wise. So. Um, the best way to do that is to aggressively invest in the renewable technologies. But instead, these meters that are being put on people's houses, underwritten by the federal government to the tune of billions of dollars, don't have the functionality built in them at all to, to integrate the renewable technology. So what's the big hurry then? Why would you rush to underwrite billions of dollars of meters? Well, it's in the name of, you know, stimulus funding to create jobs, I guess, and, and green, you know, clean tech and things like that. But the reality is that these meters are dumb meters. They're not smart meters, and they're pushing them out. But they are, they do have the ability to have, um, to, um, to, 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 um, well, for surveillance purposes. Surveillance. They, are, they have the ability to know exactly what, your, what sort of electric, electrical appliances you're using when, and to, they'll know whether you're home or not, these things are hackable by, uh, by strangers because it's wireless. They could possibly, through the wireless mesh network, even get into your own personal and financial information in your home. Um, there are um, serious security issues with, with um, a wireless grid like this um, from, um, you know, people like... Um, right. How long will it be before there's an app for that? So like a smart meter criminal network app and you like just use your cell phone, you walk by someone's house, be like, oh, I, n I know they're not there or uh, I know they have a drum set, uh, you know. So incredible issues of privacy. It's amazing. Every uh, thing in your house gives off a unique electrical signature. Right. And so they can like tell what you're doing in your house. Now, does CVPS control that data? Um, do I have access to it? Uh, could it be subpoenaed later on in my in you know, some case? Uh, mm -hmm. Incredible amount of privacy issues mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, 
Yeah, there, um, there have been a number of papers written on the privacy issues related to the smart grid. And, and then, of course, there are also the, um, the um, issues related to a potential solar flare. Um, you right. know, we're a, a homeland security sabotage. Um, um, we're, it just doesn't make any sense at all to make this wireless. It makes sense to have a smart grid, for sure, um, to be able to integrate the renewables and to be able to allow individual homeowners to be contributors of energy into the grid through their solar panels and whatnot. That's called distributed power generation. And that's where we need to go, and there's absolutely no reason for it to be wireless. Now, one really important issue which Tina raised is that um, in Nevada, the, um, the activists down there have been trying to figure out where the funding has been coming from um, to underwrite these meters. Now, it was always our understanding that it was the Department of Energy that was, um, that was underwriting these billions of dollars of meters to help the utilities de deploy, to use their word, this kind of wireless network. Well, um, it, the, the activists in Nevada found out that the, the money is actually being spent by the U.S. Armed Forces. And um, so this adds a new twist into the equation. Maybe it explains why there's this rush to deploy these meters that aren't smart, that don't, aren't going to move us one inch towards sustainability. Right. Maybe it's a rush off on the surveillance um, front. So we're going to give all the Muslims who will probably get their smart meters first, mm -hmm. and then the environmental activists next. Um, and they can watch us and make sure we're not talking about smart meters. Um, or whatever. You know, it's a real How concern. paranoid do you get in the modern world? Is it, it's a fine question. I would tell you, I was never a paranoid person, and, um, but the more I've learned about the degree to which there is a corp corporate influence here and, mil and possibly military influence, um, I, um, that old, uh, you know, U.S., don't tread on me, you know, I want my privacy, is definitely um, coming to the surface. The Constitution guarantees us privacy in our home and papers. Um, and I think that includes smart meters and like uh, the corporate utility, like telling everything that goes on in my house all day long. Uh, it just seems like incredible, incredibly unconstitutional by design. Yeah, I, I personally, on the one hand, I think, well, who really cares whether they know when I run my washing machine or dishwasher? I don't have anything to hide. But on the other hand, if you look at the big picture of what's happening and who's going to have this data, what are they going to do with it? Are we going to be just marketed to based on our habits like, like we already are? Um, you know, it's a, it's a matter, it's like, are we going to be controlled or are we free? It's like that's what it comes down to. I heard a particularly egregious example of... Um, uh, the geopositioning units using to track uh, rich customers and then they would market the data to like, uh, oh, this person went to a new car, bought a new car, so then they would, uh, you can really direct, direct market people uh, very with that data and so it's, 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 it's also the whole issue of peak and off peak and, you know, most people are always going to cook dinner between, I don't know, what, six and eight, is that going to be like more expensive, mm -hmm. you know, because... Right. Well, that's the whole rationale for this, mm. is that the, the, we really do need, we need an upgrade in the electric grid. There is demand, there are times where there's a peak load demand that we can't, that the utilities can't meet. So they want to be able to disincentivize usage during those times. And so now they will be able, they can do it now with, with pricing, you know, by the hour, but um, they will be able to actually disable your washing machine in the middle of the load. Mm. And this, we've already heard cases of this, hmm. where the, you know you can't finish your what because they, they, you know, they've chosen to control that. So yeah. wow. that's um, um, we can't control our washing machines anymore because yeah. CBPS is wants to cut their load. And then also the variable pricing wow. is going to affect a lot of people, and um, where they'll disincentivize people by uh, real time changes in the pricing, and and they're thinking that everybody's going to sit around on their on their PDA or on their computer and monitor, you know, carefully monitor their utility costs and change their behavior. I think that, um, they, you know, they're spending billions of dollars in order with that assumption that this is going to motivate people to change their behavior. Think about how that those billions of dollars could have been used right. otherwise to educate people about the need to create sustain sustainability and to invest in, in renewable solar technologies and where, and where it's right. solar, wind, geothermal, thermal, biodiesel, ocean thermal. There are a lot of exciting options out there, and we are not aggressively pursuing them at all. And if we really wanted to spend our money valuable, we just put a solar panel on everybody's house, 
Um, but unfortunately, that means there's no utilities. I mean, that's right. It's a matter of it's control, keeping the control at the centralized level as opposed to decentralized, and that is, I'm sure, a very big issue here of why they're not moving toward distributed generation. But but it will be it will happen. It has to ultimately will have to happen. Hmm. And we're coming out with a white paper. Actually, um, it'll be in sometime in February that um, describes the technology that will allow us to have the distributed generation and to integrate the renewable technologies because we want to empower people like yourselves at the local level that know there's a problem with um, the biological effects from this radiation that also don't like the idea of these meters for the privacy and security and sabotage type of risks but um, but want, don't know what the alternative is to be proposing specifically. And so we're working with somebody who's a real insider in the whole smart grid um, development, and, and we will be describing what exactly is the technology that communities ought to be going for instead of what, right. what's under consideration here right now in Vermont. So you think it makes sense to just try to stop this in its tracks because it will be obsolete? I mean, if it can't incorporate renewables. On economic grounds, for that very reason, it may make absolutely no sense. Mm -hmm. And yet, who's paying for this? The consumer's paying for this. Taxpayer you know, money. The, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, well, also, the, in many, several states, the consumers actually have to purchase the meter. Oh, wow. Yeah. And here in Vermont, um, we urge everyone to opt out because that's really a way of voting with your feet on this issue if you feel strongly about it, you know, for the health reasons. Right and the privacy and security, um, so you, can you can choose not to have it. At this point, CVPS and GMP, merging with GMP, are imposing a $10 monthly fee, which we feel is really obnoxious because the fees are already built right. into our, the billing system as it stands. And, right. um, and how, uh, how do they opt out? What should people do to opt out? They should call CVPS, um, call them, uh, and tell them they want to opt out. Um, there's also, I know some people have sent letters as well, uh, mm -hmm. in addition, and some people, you know, have sent registered letters just, just to really... Just call the number on their bill. Yeah, call the number on the mm -hmm. bill, usually for, you know, for questions. There's a, mm -hmm. a number. Um, mm -hmm. And apparently CVPS did say they were going to send out notices two months prior to the beginning of deployment. So there should be warnings in your bill, but I wouldn't wait for a warning. I would, mm -hmm. I would call right. now and just... Well, uh, I would recommend that people take a real hard look at what's been happening in California, where people have really resisted these meters. And um, a group of them recently had an electrician come and take the meter off of their home, and, and they returned them en masse and <laughs> to, the, to the Pacific PG&E, Pacific Gas and Electric. And um, those people were, they were shooed out of the office and... and um, and then their electricity was cut off in their home right, uh. right before <laughs> Christmas. And, um, and then the, but fortunately, oh, the, the head of PG&E um, recently came out with a statement and to his credit really said the right thing, which is if our customers are objecting to this and this ferociously, well, those weren't the exact words he used, but if our customers are objecting, we need to we need to take a hard look at this, and, right. and there must be a, there must be a problem here that we need to acknowledge and do something about it. So I'm paraphrasing, but he really said the right thing, and that is the truth. If people by the hundreds of thousands in states around the country, like California, but also Minnesota, Maine, Florida, uh, New Mexico, um, Arizona, if people are up in arms over these smart meters everywhere, there obviously are right. problems that they need to be looking at. It also contributed to fires and like frying electronics. Yeah. Um, I'll show you a slide right now through the magic of technology of a burnt meter from California. And um, so it also like encourage people to talk to their politicians and their, um, you know, Vermont has a pretty good uh, congressional delegation, but uh, unfortunately they're behind this and I, I assume they just don't know. I sort of trust Bernie Sanders to come down on the right side of the issue often, but in this one, not yet. I, I um, think it's maybe because really people have a hard time. It's the whole thing with the FCC guidelines that are frequently quoted as sort of like the... Right. Why don't we unpack that a little bit? The uh, FCC guidelines are set up for a 220-pound military recruit and for thermal heating effects. So this is the 30-year-old year old standards, and uh, but what we're talking about, much subtler uh, levels of influence. Like, you were saying something interesting last night that the um, lower levels can Im impact even more. Like, say, the blood brain barrier, very subtle layer mm -hmm. levels of. Uh, 
Yeah, there was, um, there's been um, a research by Dr. Leif Selford and his team at, the, at Lund University in Sweden. They looked at the effect on, um, from this kind of radiation on the brain, and well, it was in rats. And um, after a very brief period of time, there was um, permeability in the blood-brain barrier that allowed um, albumin leakage and probably other things leaking into the brain, toxins and whatnot. But the, the real um, concern about the research was it showed that it wasn't the, um, we, it, we all understand the concept of dose response, like the higher, the higher something is, the worse you'd expect the, the impact to be biologically. And we, that is true from the power, power part of the risk. But there's also the risk from the frequencies not, that are not related to the power that are, um, that could be at very right. non-thermal levels. And those, it turns out that it, the lower the level, the higher the risk of um, neuron death in the right. brain and the greater permeability of the blood-brain barrier. Probably because the brain works at such low voltage anyway, it starts to interact with those systems. Um, y there's, you were saying something interesting about the neural nets and that they fire in a vacuum and so the extracellular spaces around the neural nets kind of require a sort of maybe a radiation-free space and so maybe this is causing like uh, less, uh, the neurons not to fire so well because of those low frequencies adding up and interacting? Well, there's an increasing body of research um, showing the effects on the brain. A, I mean, there's one that just came out the other day, or it's in press right now in Greece. There's Nora Volko's work from the NIH, which is the first research studied, funded by the U.S. government since, um, since the U.S. government stopped funding this, this whole um, area of research called bioelectromagnetics, um, which was used to be the biggest and the finest lab in the world in this area. And right before the um, introduction of the cell phone infrastructure across this country, beginning in the 90, early 90s, um, that, um, that, that was really shuttered. They're down to a half a person is allocated, half a person in um, wow. funding for research in so this area. So let us not look to our government for protection in this regard. We'll have to this get your information on the outside, like right, right here at GNAT and uh, on the interweb. Um, I, there's this assumption that the government is just like looking after us, I think. And in this case, the, the, the horse is out of the barn and the government is not doing its job. Yeah, it really is shocking to me, and that's why I became an activist in this area, um, because I realized that the government has known about the science. It's been around since the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. It's been, it's not, not news that there are biological effects. So somebody somewhere has had an attitude of, it's a very military type of attitude, of like the concept of collateral damage. Oh, well, we got to do this, and yeah, there's going to be some collateral damage. You know, oh, well, yeah, so, you know. Some kids nine, get autism. 900% increased re risk of cancer, um, you know, for women who live within half a mile of a cell phone tower. Oh, well, you know. I'm sorry, but we really can't have that attitude. It's not acceptable. And we need to be checking up on our government. We can't have the dependency mentality that, you know, somebody else is looking out for us and we'll be fine. We need to be responsible. We need to be accountable once we know that there is this science. And we need to be vocal and share the information and restore democracy in this country to, so that the world that we live in is shaped by the values that we hold. And I'm sure that most people in this country hold the value for, for um, um, good health and, um, you know, support nurturing our, our biology and, and our ecosystem. And so we need to t take, it, take it back. And um, from the um, influences that have um, either knowingly or unknowingly degraded our health and our environment. Speaking of knowingly or unknowingly, uh, you mentioned yesterday that we may come to a Nuremberg moment at some point in this issue, and that at some point uh, accountability is required. I think um, I was just writing about the, the, the failure of the climate talks in um, Durban, South Africa, and just what an incredible lapse of responsibility our government has done with climate. And at some point, we need a climate Nuremberg where we say, who's accountable? Todd Stearns? I'm looking at you. You just led the U.S. to not do anything on climate. They want to wait eight years to do anything on climate. Mm -hmm. This is criminal in an age where our planet is really going off the edge. And yeah, there may be a point of no return, and I don't know whether we've passed it yet or not. But in terms of the DNA effects, you know, how do you, how do you repair that? Um, 
then also the effects on nature, like the crop pollinators that pollinate right, a very large percentage of our crops, the, f the fruits, the nuts, the vegetables. And so um, we know that even though there are all these other explanations for why the bees are dis disappearing, like um, chemical issues and mites and infections of one sort or the other, but this situation with bee colony collapse disorder is a little different because the bees are not just dying, they're disappearing by the millions. Right. They're going somewhere else where they like it better. You know, and so, so say it's, there's a, the magnetite in the belly of the bee that's somehow used for their navigation that might be picking up the cell phone waves. Right, and birds also are in the magnetite, and birds is also affecting their sense of direction. And uh, we have magnetite in our brains as well. Um, so there are, um, there are consequences, and we are, t we are indeed taking very large risks for, for civilization, and we need to understand them. We are already seeing the influence on infertility statistics. We know, um, well, one study I can cite it from the Cleveland Clinic showed that um, um, one-third of male sperm was lost, um, killed after... Um, a very brief, I think it was an hour exposure to a cell phone. This is and the only. This is the only benefit. Might keep the yeah, seven billion people exactly. now. You know, everybody radiate yourself and. Yeah, and half of the remaining sperm was was um, deformed or non-viable, and so we are see, You know, these um, we're seeing these, this this kind of fertility research all around the world, and and there is a group in England that a radiation research trust that has fund developed an advertising campaign that's called a Save the Male campaign. And it's being, there's these posters have been put in male uh, men's bathrooms in London, and they're available for download. Anyone can post them anywhere, but they're to try to educate young men in particular to not put the cell phone in their pocket and to stay away from these kind of radiation so devices. Can, so can you advise us on some good, healthy cell phone habits? Like, I've heard it said that the cell phone in a car takes 15 times more energy to get out of the metal of your car, so ideally don't use it in the car. Uh, well, how do you carry one? You said uh, that using a, a, w a wire into it was better, mm -hmm. but not necessarily the speakerphone. Well, the speakerphone is better than having it against your ear because it's, you know, the power would be right near your head. And so the speakerphone is better from that point of view that it's, it's not right up against your brain. But it is um, radiating, you know, your hand, the rest of your body, and the, when you're on speakerphone mode, the battery um, uses more power. So you're affected by more of the magnetic field exposure from the battery. So the, really, the truly safest is a wired headset from the phone um, to, um, to your ear, either in the form of, you know, something you wear over your head, or there are these terrific new phones that um, look like the old-fashioned AT&T phones co and that can come in many different colors. You can get them on Amazon. They're called Yubz, Y-U-B-Z phones. And um, they, are, they are just terrific. Right. And um, so, so in terms of you want to minimize your exposure, and, and certainly in your home, you, you, have the, you can control that environment. You can have an Ethernet cord to your computer. If you need a mul multiple stations to have, uh, use your computer around the house, you have multiple ether Ethernet cords. So you, there's no reason why somebody needs a wireless router at home. That's number one. You can create a clean sanctuary. You should also not have portable phones. Portable phones are just as bad as a cell phone. It's the same radiation. I had no idea. It's the same radiation, sometimes much higher. And the thing with this portable phone is that if it's sitting there on the table, say by your bed, it's, it's communicating between the base station and the handset all the time. Whereas with the cell phone exposure, you're just using it for the length of your call. So portable phones are really um, contributing to insomnia and, and many other health problems, and people have no idea. So you should go back to the landline hard hardwired mm. phone as much as possible. Maybe have a portable for when you need it in an emergency, special right. occasion. The car breaks down, mm -hmm. great time for a cell phone. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned baby monitors. Um, can you lay that out for us? Yeah, baby monitors, well, the new, new type of baby monitors are, um, they're wireless baby monitors, and they operate at um, 2.4 gigahertz. That's the same frequency as Wi-Fi. So, and not only is the baby being exposed to this radiation, but also the caregiver who's in the other room sitting near this, um, the other part of it. So um, the old-fashioned baby monitors work just fine. They were hardwired, and we need to be going back to those. So you, you would suggest that, like, if you have a baby monitor, you should 
how to get it wired from the third floor to the first floor you just ideally yeah 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 um, I mean think about it for a second would you put would you allow an animal to um, like a dog to be um, you know a puppy to be right near a radio frequency transmitting device no your no. sensibility would say oh no that wouldn't be good for the dog's nervous system you would just know better just like people know to not have a dog right near the TV the instincts you know like you don't do that but, but for some reason, people are just trusting that the baby monitors are, are okay because they're in the store for sale and they must be okay. Right. So mm -hmm. can, if you could talk a little bit about how these things are cumulative. So say you have the baby monitor and then you have your Wi-Fi and then you get a cell phone call. Like, they kind of stack on each other, don't they? Or how does that work? Right. Well, we need to be thinking not only about the, um, the acute exposures, um, but the um, the long term effects of the chronic exposures and which I think just what smart meters the wireless smart meter would be dumping a huge that's right addition that's right. into our environment chronic. if you think about it, our body we can withstand a little bit of you know disruption we get it all the time in many kinds of stress in our lives um, but we go back and we would need to go back to balance and that's why where you sleep at night is the most important place to make sure that that's clean of electromagnetic fields because you want the body to have the best chance of going back into that homeostasis and so um, if you're chronically exposed and you never get a chance to, to really fully rest and repair um, you're just setting yourself up for um, well, degrading the biology and setting yourself up for one thing or the other to break, to start to break down mm -hmm. faster. People are calling this, this is accelerating aging, wow. this, these kinds of exposures. So this might be an interesting moment for your, your personal story. Like uh, you got into this because um, uh, someone put a, cell, a Wi-Fi router on the other side of a wall at a house you were renting and then you got, got Yeah, I was living it? in um, San Francisco in an apartment and I'd been living there fine for quite a while and then um, suddenly started noticing I was having I was getting a little dizzy I was having trouble concentrating I was getting harder I noticed harder heart irregularities never felt that before started getting skin rashes my vision changed dramatically wow. lots and lots of little things and and um, it got I got so bad that in the morning I'd wake up and I'd have to hold on to the wall I was so dizzy and I knew something was terribly wrong, and I didn't know who to turn to. I didn't know what kind of doctor to go to. I studied a lot of health and medicine over the years, and I knew what it wasn't. And I, on some level, I felt just fine. And so my, and I didn't understand why I'd feel so badly in this apartment. But I go to the coffee shop down the street, and and I could think clearly and write my to-do list with no problem. So I was, was a detective, and I figured out what was going on. It was a new neighbor that had moved in. They put a wireless router right on the other side of the wall from my, from my pillow. Mm. And this, over time, over a couple of months, they'd lived there a couple of months by the time I figured it out, I was being worn down, and I couldn't function there. I couldn't live mm. there. So, so, and this is cool. happening to people. I get calls from people all the time in, in places like Manhattan. You know, they don't know what to do. They say the person upstairs has a Wi-Fi router to my left, down below, you know. So from overexposure, you became hypersensitive. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. So yeah. th this is just contributing another layer. That, right. And even if, I mean, I do, again, urge everyone to opt out. And I understand that the $10 fee is a financial, you know, um, problem, you know, for, for many. But apparently these, you know, people's bills where these wireless meters have been uh, deployed have really gone up exponentially and in right. some instances just, yeah. you know. And the smart meter can, can contribute to this situation she spoke of. That's like, right. So what if uh, you live in a condo unit and all the smart meters are right outside your house and you have a bank of 40 of them and they're all zapping all the time? How are they going to You're really in trouble if you live near a bank of those meters, like in an apartment complex. That is not good. And it's not good even just to have a single meter either. They're putting them on the electric meters, the gas meters, the water meters. Water meters. And it's, in my case, when I got the, started getting these symptoms, I was able to remove myself. I picked up and I left and I went to a low EMF place. And I rest I took several, it took several months to really restore my health. But, you know, you're not going to be able to do that if you're noticing your, your system is, is not functioning uh, well. If you have a smart meter on your house, you're not going to be able to, mm. how, where are you going to go? Mm -hmm. You know, so really we need mm -hmm. to make the right kind of choices up front and, and, um, and not subject people to these, um, to these kind of risks. Right.
I think and, another and thing. And the cost that you mentioned yeah. also, that many, uh, many states people are having um, their bills in it unexplainably going up, and so sometimes it's very common that the bills are doubling and tripling. Occasionally we've heard cases where it's gone up by ten times. It's and people can't well, afford it, and they think there must be something wrong, and they, they ask This is the why utility the utilities want it, because it's like they can get micro manage your like the usage you know they can really tell how much you're using down well, to the be, micro it may be that it may be that it's more accurate and i've heard that argument um, or it may be that it's m the meters malfunctioning uh. and um that's what there is evidence for also that in a high um, rf environment that it's it's um causing the meters to to malfunction so wow. Yeah, and there's, the, of course, the secondhand smoke analogy, which I, I think is, which maybe I mentioned. But anyway, just, you know, individuals can opt out, but if you've got this, this pervasive layer, you know, that you've... Electro-smog. Right. Um, secondhand electro-smog. Yeah. Um, and I would like to also say something about children. Mm. Um, you know, children, we know, are much more sensitive to this kind of radiation. They're... Um, a recent research study that was published um, about um, two months ago showed that children's brains, well, we're talking about cell phones now, that children um, absorb twice as much radiation in the brain as, a, as an adult, um, th th um, three times as much in certain parts of the brain, the hippocampus and hypothalamus, and um, more radiation in the eyes and ten times the amount of radiation in the bone marrow. And so children, children are extremely vulnerable to this radiation. So if you think it's bad for adults like myself to be continually yeah. exposed to this radiation, you know, what are we doing to our children? And what are we doing to them in their formative years, putting this kind of radiation into schools? Right, why so find schools? I it? saw an interesting, you talked about an interesting study last night where chip, mothers who used the cell phone a lot, the kids had more problems in school later on? Yeah, um, this was a study that was done at... Um, it was done by UCLA and a Scandinavian team from Finland, I think. And um, they showed that mothers who used a cell phone w during pregnancy had children who went, by the time they were school age and went to school, they had 54% higher incidence of um, emotional and behavioral problems. And if that child by that age was also starting to use a cell phone, him or herself, that number went up to 80% wow. increase. Um, so we're not we're seeing um, we're seeing God effects on mood. We're s new research out of Russia about two months ago by Dr. Yuri Grigoryev over there. Um, f they showed that they monitored 196 children over four years, and uh, ages seven to twelve, and they had a control group of the people, the children that weren't exposed to the wireless devices, and the ones that were. And the, they, they measured cognitive function, things like perception and memory and that sort of thing. And they found that they went from average baseline levels at the beginning of the four years to the absolute bottom of the barrel levels of scores on these, on these, these, these cognitive measures. And so it makes that you was stupider. Four, it, it makes you shocking, stupider. We're creating dumb <laughs> students. And just think about what so that's So let's Wi-Fi all the schools. This learning. is a really great like, idea. What to learning. That we, need, what's, we, need, How can you we need We need employees. We need people to be able to serve society in the various roles right. that, are, that are needed. You know, and what's going to happen dumbing down when, the population. when these children grow up and they have Man. not, their formation has been interrupted in this way. So mm -hmm. there's something mm -hmm. they talk about in externalities and in businesses like they make their money and then they often try and push the cost to the side whether that's coal companies that want to dump all their pollution into our sky and then we'll all pay the cost for the next hundred thousand years or in this case like the poor teachers in our public schools who have to deal with 50 percent of the kids now have more emotional problems because the the cell phones right. are prevalent well and, and the interesting thing is that the teachers are also affected because they're also exposed to Wi-Fi and they're also all using cell phones and so I was actually at a um, lecture recently given by a man named Nicholas Carr, who wrote the book called The Shallows. And he did, he did a, he's a very well-known journalist, and he um, did a review of the neuroscience and behavioral science on the effect of the Internet on our brain. And um, the, um, now, there was no Wi-Fi issue here, because he really wasn't focused on that. But um, he found that, you know, people think in all their multitasking and being able to access the internet and all this information, so much more information readily available to us and the speed, the velocity of it, it's actually shaping our brains in a different way. Similar to if you think about when 
we went from um, the oral tradition to a book or to reading books or when mankind um, developed the first map it actually started to use our brain in different ways and what's happening with the access to all this information as he described is that the um, we think we're being more efficient with being able to multitask, but actually the error rate is significantly higher than it otherwise would be. We might be a little speedier, but it, the error rate is, is um, very mm. high. And, and we're using these other parts of the brain at the expense of the core parts of the brain that relate to the ability to focus and the ability to form relationships. And so, um, you know, people raise the question, well, you know, teachers and ev parents, they're all also losing those parts of the brain, the, fa the ability to focus and form relationships right. in, in all of our fragmentation. So it was very interesting, the symptoms that he was describing that were uh, in the research right. attributed to the, um, the use of, of computers. And, but they, and I raised my hand, I said, you know, every single one of those symptoms, the ability, inability to focus, irritability, you know, social problems, blah, 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 they're all the same symptoms that people get from the wireless radiation. Was there ever any differentiation in the studies that you reviewed that showed whether people were getting these same symptoms on the non-wireless computers? And I think he was stunned. He had never considered it, oh. and he was, said he was interested in investigating it further. But it's, um, you know, so the adults, the caregivers are equally impaired. Hmm. So what, right. you know, it's like, hmm. are, what kind yeah. of world are we creating? Yeah, you, people, listen, what, ma what makes people happy generally is good relationships and community. And if we're training a whole generation to be sort of staring into their box or, you know, not even developing the emotional relationships, then I think that's not a, not a good trend. Um, I would like to bring it back around to our local uh, situation. In Dorset, Vermont, they just put a cell phone tower above where the w farmer's market is in Dorset. Great. Um, it was sort of sad. The um, Jay Hathaway, he was sort of local guy everybody knew, and he was really encouraged me when I became an activist and started working with Transition Town to, he's like, good job, Theo. You know, I really, and I really appreciated that. He's a good guy. Um, and he had a heart attack on, and, then, and the, there was no cell phone service in Dorset, so it would be, created this big call for cell phones to uh, to get a cell phone tower. Mm. And you know, after a few years, now they did. And ironically, they put it up right next to his son's house in Dorset. It's like insult to injury mm -hmm. somehow. Um, well, was he out hiking where you could have used a cell phone, or he what, was, didn't he have a he was walking phone, or phone in his house? Or did he, he was, was walking, and then someone bicycling. found him, and then they couldn't get the ambulance there in time. Mm -hmm. So it was. Uh, this mm -hmm. is actually why where cell phones would be great. Yep. You know, mm. These emergency situations. But it's a trade-off. It's like, are we going to just have it available in those instances when people are in the wilderness? Um, you know, and while exposing the rest of the population to this radiation that is known to cause cancer and other problems, you know. Right. So, um, but with regard to cell towers, what we do know is, well, that the, um, within a quarter mile, um, about 350, 400 meters, um, there is a very clear evidence from many parts of the world showing the symptoms of electrosensitivity that we discussed, but also showing cancer clusters. And so, um, uh, I think it's a 300 percent increased incidence of of cancer among men and women about 300, about a quarter mile and a 900 percent increase incidence of cancer in women in that particular study. But there are many studies, there's been a review of this science, right. um, about a hundred citations in a recent um, report by Blake Levitt, a science writer, and um, Dr. Henry Lai. And 80 percent of those studies showed um, biological effects in, in proximity to a cell tower. So the, the Bragg antenna ranking of schools report that came out last year is recommending that schools should be, um, uh, because children are more sensitive, at least a half a mile away from a tower. So if somebody is right next to a tower, first of all, you don't really know what direction the antennas are going. So you could actually be quite close, and the only way to really know is to have a meter. To, uh, and there are top topographical issues, like if there might be a mountain in the way, or there might be right. a, you know... A, a so if people were living in Dorset and the, t the thing just flipped on, I think, like two weeks ago, what symptoms would they s want to be on the lookout okay. for? So you would want to be, you would be um, looking at your sleep quality, seeing if you're, if you're having disrupted sleep, headaches, dizziness, ringing in the ears is a common symptom. Um, 
uh, rashes, um, uh, just a myriad of, of symptoms of, of being unwell. Heart irregularities. Heart irregularities are very common. We, we did, I was actually an author in a study that found 40% of the subjects when exposed to this radiation had some form of heart irregularity instantaneously. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's um, very important that, that anyone that lives near a tower that's just gone up be aware. And, and I did write a book with Dr. Magda Havas on this. People can read. It's called um, Public Health SOS, The Shadow Side of the Wireless Revolution. It goes through a lot of the science. And it's very simply written for the mm -hmm. average person. Um, well, we're kind of near the end. So why don't we provide people with some web resources they can look to and maybe hit a few, any more rushing topics. Um, so your website is electromagnetichealth.org? That's right. And then I also have um, on Facebook the Campaign for Radiation Free Schools yep. and, um, and then the, um, the International EMF Alliance is um, um, a group of 50 advocacy groups. There's a lot of good content there too. IEMFA.org. Okay. Yeah. This will be appearing at the bottom of your screen, as well as emfpolicy.org, which is a woman from Vermont, and Stop Smeters, which is the Vermont group that is trying to get the smart meters put on hold. Hmm. Um, Stopsmeters.org, and we have our Facebook page, um, and there's a lot of information there, you know, relevant to what's been happening in Vermont um, activism, and we urge everybody to just, you know, to opt Find out. out more about this. We are going to opt ask uh, the town meeting in Manchester. We're going to have uh, ask the town to uh, say no to smart meters. So you know, we feel this is an issue that people need to take a stand on, and um, and really fight it because it's not just oh one more you know device you know. That's right. Th we it's, this it's all this information is great, and mm. the next question is what do you do with it? And how do you get active on it? And it's not enough just to be like I learn that it, it causes cancer. Then we have to say no. We have to create a world that's free of cancer and pollution mm. by these stupid corporations. So and there's no reason, there's no benefits for us as consumers to have these meters, that's as right. Camilla pointed out. They're, they're health risks. They're cost risks. There's absolutely no it's reason. All for the and utility. It's not not for the citizen at all. Mm -hmm. It's completely for the utility. We it is now more than ever. I think. We need to take a stand for the kind of country that we want, the kind of environment that we want to live in. We, it's, it's in our power. This is America. It's in our power to take our power back. And what's happened is that the um, corporations have, have, with their commercial interests, have, 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 have gained too much power over our government. They have, in fact, almost become like a quasi-government. There's nothing bad about corporations. Corporations provide the lifestyle the, that we have today, that, um, you know, the jobs. The, I mean, there's a, they do a lot of good in our society, too, but they're commercially oriented, and there's been no check and balance. There is, our government should have been the check, you know, and the balance to right. make sure that what they're doing in their commercial pursuits is not also harming us. And so, there just has been a, as they've been asleep at the switch at our federal government on many issues, and um, I think that, and and perhaps also turning a blind eye um, because of the efforts of the lobbyists and so on to various issues. So we need to take the power. We need to take our power back. We need to, and in a peaceful way, we need to just s express ourselves as citizens in our That's communities right. that we stand for health, and we will not stand for, you know. Our, the de de degradation of our health th for just right. for the simple pursuit, the commercial interests right. of we, somebody else. We have to stand up for Mother Earth and uh, the human race and against uh, the sort of corporate tyranny and technological madness that's just sort of coming down the pike at us from a thousand fronts, whether it's hydrofracking uh, of the water supplies, where they're literally going to ruin the water supplies of uh, half the United States and for some natural gas, and then in 10 years, uh, the water supplies will be wrecked. This is an abomination. It is a sin of the human race against uh, our inheritance of the earth, and we need to fight that yeah. also. And if I could say one thing that's actually, um, I think that the greatest hope for people to become activated and engaged in restoring the earth is to, for, for people to come to understand that we actually are a part 
of the ecosystem. We're not a separate human being living on and in the ecosystem. That we actually are intrinsically connected to it. And new science um, called earthing science is validated, is showing this, that we, our bodies actually are, are dependent on getting the electrons from the surface of the earth for our health. We're in a relationship with the ecosystem. And I think when people learn about this, and, and realize that we are, um, we're one with the earth, then we're going to see people having a lot more right. respect for our, right. our, uh, our nest. So uh-huh. there's this, this is a beautiful idea, but the earthing is like walking barefoot connects you energetically to the earth, but also balances you out and grounds you because it gets you on the same frequency as the earth. Is this, this is the, the well, what, um, the, um, our bodies are electrical. And uh, down at every single cell functions on elect- with electricity and electrons. And so just like when they ground an, a, a cable system to, and to get you a good, clear television picture, um, taking out that any kind of interference, turns out that when we touch the earth through bare feet or through conductive means that are now available, um, like pads and bed sheets and things like that that are coming out onto the market, um, when we are, that are connected into the earth through a ground rod or through the ground mm. port in an outlet, when we get those electrons, um, it stabilizes our cells electrically. And as a result, all systems are in the research are showing to work better. I'll tell you, the next time you get a headache or, or have a, a hurt yourself or something, go immediately go stand with your feet on the earth and you will see these things disappear like ah, that. Interesting. It's that fast, it's that exciting, and it has the possibility to shift the consciousness to, to what we uh, need, as I was saying, to be able to see ourselves as part of the ecosystem. Once we get that, we'll see a lot more interest in restoring this beautiful planet right. that we live on. One of the uh, positive developments of late is there's more farms started last year than... Uh, farms had gone down, down, down since like 1850. And last year was the first year it went more farms were made. And it's actually one of the professions that many college graduates want to go into. It's like one of the popular things to go into. And I think it's partially for this reason of earthing. It's like the whole generation's grown up in this sort of Wi-Fi environment, and it's very healing to go out and hang out in your vegetable garden and Absolutely. walk around in bare feet and harvest the broccoli. And, uh, yeah, and it's been known for a while, but nobody's really known why. They've assumed it had to do with, you know, just being in a beautiful, natural setting, or, you know, um, but re- re- nobody really knew the, the power of those electrons until I, very I, recently. I felt that. I went through... Uh, I, did some healing through becoming a gardener. It was really, I definitely felt the time out there in the sun was somehow just sort of balanced me out. And mm-hmm. so I believe this to be true. Um, mm-hmm. um, one last thing. I, and this is a very funny bit of science. This is the climate show, and we haven't been talking too much on climate, but um, there's this idea that all this electromagnetic radiation actually acts as a microwave oven to the sky, and it is possibly contributing to global warming by heating the molecules. And so the way a microwave oven works, it, it moves the uh, molecules of your food, right? And it heats it up. So some people were positing that how much of this radiation we're endlessly sending out, it contributes to global warming. Yeah. I haven't investigated this myself personally, but I am aware that there is a group of geophysicists out there that believe that that is in fact happening and that there is an agitation happening like in a microwave oven in our atmosphere. Um, there was a book by a professor, I think his name is Robert Hellowell from Stanford. He's a professor emeritus, and it's a very technical book, and I have not um, not attempted to get through it, but it is an area that definitely needs further explana- exploration. Yes. Well, great. I think, uh, thank you, Camilla. I think it's, you just have so much information on this subject, you know, that's biology-based, you know, scientific studies, you know, by prominent researchers from all over the world, which, you know, is what people need to hear, that this is not just, you know, out of left field. I mean, this is established science that's been available that, um, you know, people need to now... People need to know the science. The thing is, people are not always swayed by science. I'm, uh, the climate issue I've been working on for years, and uh, people seem to, like, either, I think they don't know how to digest science and make decisions based on it. 
But I'm finding with smart meters the same problem. I can talk science to people about smart meters, and they don't necessarily doesn't necessarily change their attitude. I wonder what this well, means about. Well, I think about that it's because there's a confusion because there's um, other people saying, uh, you know, that the science that, that no, that science isn't right, that their science is right. So there's tremendous um, conflict within the field of science itself, and, and we certainly see it in the in the telecom and utility issues here, where where the industry is perpetuating the myth that. Um, there's no harm from this radiation unless it's hot enough to heat tissues like within a micro microwave oven. And so, and they're getting, they've been getting away with misleading the media that then spins out these stories suggesting that, oh, we don't have anything to worry about, when in fact there are thousands of studies by the independent scientists that weren't funded by the telecom or utility industries that show the biological effects down to the DNA level, you know, just as right bad in terms of fragmentation of DNA as a chest x-ray, which nobody, nobody doubts the harm there. So and that, w that's, that, that was like six, 1,600 chest x-rays equals 500 hours on a cell phone? Is it something like um, that? It, um, they were, I think you're referring to the reflex study, which was a study done by 12 institutes in seven countries in Europe. And they showed that... Um, the fragmentation in DNA, I think it was an hour or two of cell phone exposure, equivalent of that effect on DNA compared to 1,600 chest x-rays, was uh, roughly the same in terms of the, what was happening to the DNA. And that's just one of many studies that refutes the concept that there's no harm possible right. unless it's hot enough t to heat <coughs> tissues. Right. So we are, we've just finished um, critiquing an Economist article that came out that um, they, they were guilty of just buying into the, the tele telecom industry spin that, that there's no risk and they said the worst it could do was just heat the tissues a little bit, you know. Mm. So um, we, we've re refuted that. We've got 28 scientists around the world that have endorsed that letter and that, and that list is growing and we need to stop it in its tracks when we see this kind of disinformation or misinformation that is coming out where the truth is not getting to people or people are hearing both sides, they remain in a state of what's called yeah. cognitive dissonance where they hear this side, they hear that st side, they can't hold both in their head at the same time and so they just lose interest and, and, and yeah. don't get involved. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can, I that's can what's see happening. that. It's like the dueling yeah. experts and uh, that there's, as you say, so much substantial yeah. uh, information now. Well, we hope our government gets together and uh, we give props to Senator Bob Hartwell, who's going to be d doing some stuff up in Montpelier this win winter on the subject of smart meters. And um, I guess that we probably ca talked about everything. Yeah, so thank everything you, Camilla. Thank, thank you, you, Tina. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for joining us on The Climate Show.